I'm Mary Talbot and these days I write scripts for graphic novels which my husband Brian illustrates. And I'm Brian Talbot and I've been writing and drawing graphic novels and comics since the, the 70s, so quite a long time. Well, we've been together, my goodness, 50 years. So um, we're used to one another by now. <laughs> but uh, as Brian will tell you, it, felt, it feels natural. It's the same as any other kind of collaborative activity. I got started in graphic novels, well, in comics, because uh, I was unemployed. I'd uh, finished a graphics course at college and I'd met a guy in London who said, uh, Oh, if you ever do a comic, I'll publish it. And uh, I was an employee, so I thought I might as well do this comic, you know. I have work in all of these, all of these books. A lot of this under here is the work I did for DC Comics in America, mainly Sandman. It was 1975 was the first underground comic that came out. It took about another five years before doing these underground comics, which are, you know, you don't get, hard to get paid anything for them. But by the end of the five years, uh, editors had seen my work and I started to get offered work. This is a collection of all the outright stories, which is quite a nice edition. But uh, I started working on this in 1977. It was serialised from 1978. And, uh, First published in one volume, 1981. I suppose the big change came in 1983 uh, when uh, I was offered uh, a regular strip in 2000 AD. If you look at my work, I always try and choose a style that's suitable for the story. I mean, the, the style that you draw for the story, it's, it's part of the storytelling. When Brian started doing A Tale of One Bad Rat, mm. I took a particular interest. I could see that it was something different. It's the uh, book set in the Lake District. One of my most successful books is called The Tale of One Bad Rat, which the, uh, the theme of which is Beatrix Potter. But the book is actually about uh, the psychological after effect of child sexual abuse. And it's a completely non-genre book. And one of those examples where a story takes you somewhere you didn't, you never went, you didn't imagine you were going to go there. But for a while, starting with Bad Rat, I did a very sort of clear line style. You know, the lean clear style that was um, popularised by Hergé in, in his Tantan stories which is a very clear, very direct way of, of telling a, a story. It's, I still get letters today and emails from uh, people who've been abused and it's the favorite book and it helps them um, to get on with their life. I don't know, they get a lot of pleasure out of reading it. It is actually used in several um, abuse centers around the world. Shortly after Mary retired, we uh, we were sitting watching a movie or something like that. We'd had a couple of glasses of wine, and I said to Mary, "Hey, how about writing a graphic novel?" Now you're retired, and I'll draw it. And Mary said, "Yeah, well, you think so? Are you sure? Are you sure?" <laughs> and she did do, and it became the 
only British graphic novel to win a major literary award. It won the uh, Costa Book Award, uh, 2012, Daughter of a Father's Eyes. And Must have done something right. Yeah. <laughs> It's always hard to say where inspirations come from. I know that the first one, The Daughter of Her Father's Eyes, started off with Brian's suggestion was that I write something autobiographical that would be basically cataloguing my stormy relationship with my father. I was working away on this notion of doing an autobiographical piece, all the time thinking, I don't want to do this, I want to write something else rather than looking at myself. And I was vaguely aware that James Joyce had a daughter. So I thought, that's what I'll do. <laughs> I'll write about James Joyce's daughter as well as me. I'll... Basically, I was trying to hide behind Lucia Joyce, James Joyce's daughter. But I eventually worked out a way of telling the two stories together, which produced something which was better than either one or the other, you know. <laughs> I use a lot of references, you know, for clothing and stuff like that. Uh, it's good with the, the iPad over here. I can just see if I'm drawing. Yeah, I've got, I've used these hats as props. You know, if I want to draw a gun, I can pose using this. A lot of the things which are in this garden of appeared in this fictitious garden in, in rain. The tree, for example, is a key character, really, in, in the book. We came in the front door earlier on. There's a scene of, of myself <laughs> walking up the steps, and it, it's just the actual railing at the side, you know, little details um, like, like that. It adds a sense of reality to uh, a story, whether it's, whether it's a fictional story or whether it's one that's based in biographical fact. Well, I work on the script alone for a long time. I mean, the researching of the initial idea and the fleshing it out and eventually into a, into a complete script with sort of page panel descriptions and dialogue and everything. But it's really when we start working together and I've handed over the script to Brian and he starts thinking, right, OK, how's this going to look? That's when we start to work together mm. and the sort of toing and froing is going on all the time. Mm. While I'm drawing it, you know, Mary's in here every few minutes and uh, having a look and she makes suggestions. So the other side, she's constantly coming in here and suggesting I put things in drawings. So it's a very organic, a very natural, very close collaboration. After Daughter of Her Father's Eyes, it was the one about suffragettes. That, that came out in 2014. Yeah, you'd already started writing that. But you know, yeah, I was, I was, as soon as the ink was dry on, on the script for Dotter, I was starting on the, the next idea. It definitely got bitten. My interests are in gender politics, broadly speaking, and I realised that British suffragette, you know, British women's suffrage movement, I should say, which is much broader than suffragettes, is something I really didn't know very much about at all. So I um, remedied that. The suffragette book, if, if you wanted to sum it up, w what its mission was, it would be a um, slogan, use your vote. <laughs> It's a sort of rallying cry to young people in particular to, to become politically engaged to the extent at least of voting. After Sally Heathcote's suffragette came the red version and the vision of Utopia, which was going a bit further back in history and crossing the channel and looking at a French revolutionary feminist called Louise Michel. 
And I came across her in this book called The World That Never Was. She was an amazing, absolutely amazing woman. She was like a secular saint. And uh, she was absolutely fearless. And during the Paris Commune, she fought on the barricades, you know, and she used to run in front of machine guns and all sorts of things. She was a bit crazy. Uh, but fantastic woman, I said to Mary, oh, this is, she'd make a great subject for a graphic novel. And Mary did a great graphic novel based on it. Well, this one, it's all in, <clears throat> it's all in uh, monochrome. As you can see, but the only colour used is, uh, is red, being the colour of revolution and the colour of blood. And she, her nickname was the Red Virgin of Montmartre. In Alice in Sunderland, which is all about stories and storytelling, I use a variety of styles. The legends of Lampton Worm are told in a sort of arts and crafts sort of style. There's a ghost story which I tell in a 1950s American hor horror comic style, complete with the story host who introduces it. So it's what it feels like, really, you know, what the story feels to me. It took you a long time to work out how to do rain. Didn't yeah. It? it was supposed yeah. to be a, a quick style, but it didn't mm. end up that no. way. <laughs> hard to put a finger on precisely when the project starts because you mull things over for months, years sometimes. In the case of rain, I can tell you exactly when it started. On the 1st of January 2016, <laughs> I started thinking about a potential story set in Hebden Bridge. I had the people in my head <laughs> who were the beginnings of a, a couple, a fictional couple experiencing the, the devastating floods in Hebden Bridge. And it developed from there. I mean, I've never had something that's popped out quite so immediately. Clearly, I was responding to what was in the news. It turned into a set of characters in my head. And one of them was a, was a local, a resident of Hebden Bridge, and the other one was a Londoner who came up to visit her. Uh, during the course of the story, they started to have a romantic entanglement, which I hadn't in intended at all at the beginning. <laughs> and it, basically, it, it traces the way it impacts on them, the way it tears their lives apart, the way it affects the, the local population and so on. I like the um, gloss effect on the, on the raindrops coming down the window. You know, we did, went up to do the most. It's just the wide. Really wide, it opens a lot of sky, so that's why I chose a landscape format to do the book. So when we have the shots on the up on the moors, you get this nice sense of uh, width. I think the other books I've done with Mary have been mainly um, in monochrome, um, or we just spot colour, touches of, of colour now and again, watercolour. I thought it'd be good to do that, do rain in a variety of variety of colours. The brilliant thing, of course, about comics generally is that the, there's more than one medium. You've got the language, you've also got the images, and a lot of the, a lot of the task, very enjoyable task, is deciding which ideas, which points, whatever, need to be represented in language, and which are better off expressed in images. The hope to get across things to people via a story and that's interesting in its own right. For a lot of people, certainly for me, it's a very new form and you can experiment and do interesting, exciting things with it. I think more easily than I would be able to do with a more traditional novel. Mm -hmm. 